So I'm a really big fan of planning it out and really thinking hard about what the future holds and how to get there and then doing a little bit at a time so that it's not so overwhelming. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 242. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here on a weekly basis to take your health to the next level. This week, our featured guest is Sarah Knight. She's the international best-selling author of The Life-Changing Magic of Not Giving a Fuck, which has been translated into more than 20 languages and has hit bestseller lists all over the world. In 2015, she left corporate life behind and moved with her husband from Brooklyn to the Dominican Republic. And we get into the details right at the beginning of the interview. Today, we're focusing in on her latest book, You Do You. I really enjoy Sarah as an author. She is so punchy, raw, real, entertaining, and she brings humor into her books. And her book, You Do You, is such an easy read, while at the same time, it gives so much actionable information that you can take on right away. And some of the things that we get into include good selfish versus bad selfish, there is nothing actually wrong with you, be as weird as you feel like being, congratulate yourself, stop people pleasing, ask for what you want, and you will learn what mental redecorating is. Lots of great tips and tools, lots of great conversation. Here we go with Sarah Knight. Hello, Sarah. Welcome to the show. How's it going today? Uh, It's going pretty well. Thank you guys for having me. It's a pleasure. We're excited to have you on the show. We've got lots to talk about. But first, I want to start with a move that you made outside of the busy city of New York to the Dominican Republic. And you made this a very conscious choice. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this story? Sure. So I had been living and working in New York for about 15 years, and I decided to quit my corporate job as a book editor. And part of the reason that I quit that job was because I no longer wanted to live in New York City anymore. And my husband, thankfully, agreed with me. So we spent some time figuring out an alternative living situation. And we made the move to a little fishing village called Las Terenas in the Dominican Republic in January of 2016. There was obviously a lot of things leading up to this decision. So walk us through some of this. What got you to your wit's end? Well, New York City is a wonderful, vibrant, thrilling place, but it is also really stressful and there's a lot going on and it's in the Northeast of the United States, which means it's not very warm all the time. And um, those were all things that had really been weighing on me in addition to just my working situation. I realized that I'm not really cut out for corporate life. And even though I was really good at it and I was quite successful at my job, which is why it took me so long to decide to leave it behind, it really wasn't making me happy anymore. And really the premise for these big life changes that I've made in the last couple of years and all the books that I've written that deal with them and how to make these changes was really about being happier. So was Dominican Republic on your radar for a period of time? Why did you pick this place? I know the weather there is awesome overall, but what was the motivating factor? Yeah, well, we did some research. My husband did a lot of that research. And we had actually a spreadsheet, which had all of the different things that we were looking for. So for example, not just the average daily temperature, but also access to decent health care, reasonably close to the eastern coast of the US, since we still had family and friends that we wanted to be able to visit, and we wanted them to be able to visit us relatively easily and stability of government and cost of living and all of these things factored in. So we had a pretty healthy spreadsheet and we were looking at a bunch of places and it's not that complicated. We watched a lot of international house hunters and a lot of beachfront bargain hunt and a lot of island time or whatever those shows are called. And we became acquainted with a bunch of different places in that way, then researched them a little bit more thoroughly. And the Dominican Republic was very high on our list, as was Coronado in Panama. But we came to the DR first, and we actually just fell in love with this town, Las Terenas, and we decided that was where we were going to go. So all of that research helped, but we actually didn't go in person to any other place. Well, with the internet now and the accessibility that gives people, for instance, Marnie and I now, we've gone from other jobs. I was a chiropractor, Marnie was a nutritionist, and she was teaching cooking classes. And now this podcast has become our full-time career, and we're starting to explore travel. For instance, this past winter, we went to Florida for six weeks and worked from a different location. We're from Ontario, so it was nice to get away from the cold and get down there and work a bit. I bet. (laughs) This is becoming more and more of an option for people, and I think more and more people are going to continue to jump on board and start working online and having 
more location freedom. What I'd love for you to share with us, what are some of the unexpected things that came with this move to Dominican? It was surprising to me how relatively easy it was to pick up a new language. I did actually already speak French, which is something that I learned in school for 10 years, and I didn't have a lick of Spanish when I came down here, and now I can pretty much hold my own and do anything that I need to do. But that was surprising to me how quickly that came about. It was surprising to me that I had to start making new friends. It was like I hadn't really had to do that since college, and I'm almost 40 years old. And really the last time that I was plunked down in an environment where I didn't know anybody was my freshman year of college. So that's been a very, I think I have an essay in me about making friends late in life. I'm happy to say that we have a number of very good friends now that we're living here. Also, I was very surprised by the sheer volume of fauna. We share our home with a lot of creatures. They are snakes and they are cocoa rats and they are lizards and they are really big spiders. And that's something that I have had to sort of become at one with. And what about from a work perspective? How is the internet down there? How is working so far from the US and and not having that direct connection? Well, my husband would tell you that the internet is terrible because he has very high standards. But for me, it's perfectly good enough to do things like this, to be on podcasts with you guys on Skype and to do my work. So it's definitely there's room for improvement. But I know a lot of people who have come through this town as digital nomads and have been working from afar, people from Canada, people from the US and Europe, and they seem to be doing fine. A thing that really surprised me that I had been worried about was whether I would lose my motivation to work when I was surrounded by this paradise and all of this sunshine and whether I would want to just be out on my deck or in the pool or walking on the beach and not able to sit down and do my work. And I am pleased to report that because I have the sun all the time now, which I didn't when I was living in Brooklyn, now it's like I can use that still as sort of a special treat to go lay out for a couple of hours and read a book. But I'm totally able to get immersed in my work and be sitting in the shade and on my laptop and it's not a problem. So I was a little bit concerned that both the move to freelancing and the fact that I was freelancing in what I thought might be a distracting paradise would hinder me, and I'm glad that it hasn't at all. And you quickly touched on making new friends, and this is something Marnie and I actually, a year ago, we moved to a different part of Ontario. We moved from Toronto to Windsor, and this is something we just had firsthand experience with, and we're continuing to make new friends, and it's been a really smooth process for us and really enjoyable. You said you might have an essay in you on this, so I'd love, and I think the audience could get a lot from this, Let's talk about people who are maybe moving to a new area or just find themselves within a group of friends in their current area and they might find that those relationships aren't the healthiest and they want to start looking for new people to bring into the group or new people to start hanging out with. How do we start? Well, what we did, my husband and I came down here and we really didn't know anybody. And we're adults now and we're very self-sufficient, both as individuals and as a couple. So we weren't too worried about it. We figured we would have the luxury of meeting people and deciding who would become our closest friends down here versus who would just become sort of acquaintances. But as I said, you know, the last time I did this, I was 18 years old. And I think at that time in my life, I felt a lot more pressure to be liked and to conform and to be popular and to act in a way that wouldn't drive people away. And that's something that I talk about a lot in my latest book, You Do You, having discovered the fact that I am who I am. At this point in my life, I'm not going to change too much. And that the people that are going to become my friends, whether I met them in New York City or in Las Terrenas or on vacation in Vegas or something, are the people who are going to appreciate me right up front being exactly who I am and not kind of censoring myself in order to get people to like me. So What I've found here at this time in my life is that it's been really freeing, really liberating to just be who I am and have the opinions that I have and the politics that I have and the values that I have. And if people are drawn to that and I'm drawn to them, great. And if not, it's fine. I don't have to be friends with everybody that I see in the grocery store. You know, it is a small town, so don't exactly want to make enemies. But I've just felt like we've been able to be a lot more organic and choosy in terms of who we spend our time with. Whereas the last time that I had to do this, I definitely felt pressured to just get along with everybody. 
And I think something that you did, and this brings up the book as well, is that you really prioritized your needs. You did what felt right to you. You assessed the situation and you made a move for you. And it sounds like your husband was on board too. And this is a really important concept to talk about, about harnessing selfishness in a healthy way and how we can start making decisions day to day that honor who we are without meeting or caring about the standards of other people. So let's just talk about using selfishness in a healthy way. Yeah. I mean, when I was writing You Do You, I actually had gone through a time in my life where, and this is a little bit morbid, but it's true and it's blunt and it's kind of the way my books come across. I had gone through a time where I had suddenly lost a number of people, people who died unexpectedly or young. And it really made me think, we don't have all the time in the world. We don't even necessarily know how much time we have. So why would I, if I didn't have to, spend my life doing something that I didn't want to do with people I don't want to do it with or in a place that I don't want to do it? So the concept of selfishness came a little bit from that morbid place of, if I don't do it now, when am I going to do it? Or what if I don't have a chance? And then it grew, and I wrote a whole chapter about it in You Do You, into the difference between good selfish and bad selfish and saying, you know, a lot of people in our society think of selfish as a four-letter word and something that you should absolutely not do or be under any circumstances. But in my opinion, if you're looking out for your own best interests, as long as that doesn't prevent you from also being a kind, empathetic, generous person to the people around you, then you're fine. And the metric there is, is this decision that I'm making going to hurt anybody else more than it helps me? And if the answer is no, then you do you. (laughs) So I've applied that to a lot of different areas of my life. And I have to say, everything is much better since I have started doing that. I think that's also a really important point to bring up is that throughout your whole book, you're talking about choosing to do things which can come off a little bit harsh. But your whole method is doing it in a kind way. And I think that's the big difference in this. So many of us go through life and we make these choices and we kind of brush people off and we feel like we need to be an (laughs) asshole about it. And we don't need to. We can really do this in a really kind way and being upfront and being confident and being self-assured with what we're going through. So I really love that part of the book and that message throughout. Thank you. I really focus on being honest and polite because I think that if you can work your way onto the honesty and politeness matrix, you can really get a lot of things accomplished without hurting anybody's feelings. There are situations in which being totally honest is actually impolite. And there are situations where you're trying to be too polite and you end up fibbing and then you get caught in a lie and then people are more upset. I prefer to just be as direct as possible, you know, without hurting anybody's feelings so that people know what to expect from me, then I uphold their expectations rather than making them think that I'm a certain kind of person and pulling the rug out from under them later. Sarah, I want to stop and dig in a little bit longer on the selfishness topic here and talk about how we can be selfish while still having regard for others. I'd love for us to dig in deeper by giving a couple examples so the listeners can get a real feel for how this looks. Yeah. So, you know, I give some examples in the book in You Do You where I say you have to put on your own oxygen mask before helping others because you're no good to anybody if you haven't selfishly preserved your ability to be well rested and not overbooked and overburdened and overdrawn at the bank and all of that stuff. One example I said is, you know, you could volunteer to get all of the cupcakes for your office party you know, you're doing something nice for other people. And you also know that means that you can get a dozen of your favorite flavor. But if you were being bad selfish, you would just get all of them your favorite flavor and to hell with what anybody else wants. You see what I mean? So there's this idea of being able to look out for what you want and make sure that you get it without taking away from somebody else. And that's really the equation. So another example I gave in the book, which may or may not be related to somebody that I know very well, is you need to get your rest and you need to recharge in order to be there for your friends and family. And that's fine if you want to go take a four-hour nap and come back refreshed. But you can't expect to take that nap on the couch in the middle of the living room and have everybody else tiptoe around you. That's bad selfish. So if you take those kind of fun, 
simple day-to-day little examples and you, you can really apply them to anything. And you'll see, you'll really start to learn that it's all about not taking away from somebody else in order to give you what you need. And Sarah, I want to come back to your story now for a little bit. And you share a story towards the end of your book, a really pivotal moment on your journey. And this is before going to Dominican, before writing your books. And this is at age 31, where you actually have your first full-blown panic attack. So I just love for you to share this story and what happened here. Yeah, I mean, I was working at a New York City Midtown High Rise publisher's office, and I had been feeling sort of ill for a while. And I had had all of these symptoms that I didn't quite understand what they meant. You know, I have a short of breath and I had headaches and I had a stomach ache. And I told my husband that morning, you know, I really don't feel well. And he said, maybe you're hungover. And I said, no, I, you know, I had a couple glasses of wine last night. That's not it. And progressively, as I was on the subway, which was 15 stops, I think, from where I was living at the time to this office, I was just feeling worse and worse. And I got up to my desk and I really thought I was going to throw up. And I ran to the ladies' room and I didn't throw up, but I thought I was going to. And I did that a couple times. And then I went back. Long story short, my arms started going numb and my vision was blurring. And I said, Oh my God, something's happening to me. Help. And a colleague of mine got me down to the nurse's office. There was actually an on site infirmary in that building. And I thought, I've been poisoned. I mean, that is the ridiculous, totally irrational, illogical conclusion that I came to that this is why this was happening to me. And the nurse, kind of looked at me after I'd calmed down a little bit. And she said, have you ever had a panic attack? And I was like, oh, no, you've got to be kidding me. That's what this is. And so began my now multi-year experience with panic attacks. They're terrible. They're awful, awful things. There are lots of ways to help avoid them, but sometimes they just happen. And it's good to know that that's what's happening to you instead of that you have been poisoned. Now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with Sarah to give a shout out to our show partner, Perfect Keto. Perfect Keto's Keto Perform is honestly my secret weapon in the morning. It's especially amazing before I am doing a workout, if I'm going for a run or going to the gym, it gets me energized, it gets me focused, it gets my body ready. It's got some green tea in there, it's got ketones, a little bit of MCT oil powder. I just mix that with a little bit of water. Sometimes I'll add in a little bit of greens, but it's ready to go on its own. It's got a lemon flavor, very clean tasting, no additives, no fillers. So if you want to give Keto Perform a try, add it to your cart, and try on your next workout with a little bit of Keto Perform in your system. And as a listener of our show, you get 20% off Keto Perform and all the other Perfect Keto products. To take advantage, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. These products ship worldwide, free shipping in the US. Go and get yours today. Now we're going to give a shout out to our other show partner, Thrive Market. If you haven't checked out Thrive Market, today is your day. It is like Whole Foods and Costco, a hybrid of the two put together. You can order all the best health food products right from the comfort of your home. And that's for those of you living in the USA. And we love so many of the products that are available at Thrive Market. And one of those products is Simple Mills. And this is a company that makes grain-free cookie mixes, muffin mixes, bread mixes, as well as lots of delicious crackers. And as Jesse and I are coming off of the Whole30, we're super excited to have these almond and seed-based crackers back in our lives. They are so good. So if you want to try Simple Mills products, Look on Thrive Market, just type in Simple Mills. You can see the variety of different products they have. Add them to your cart and get to know them, especially if you are eating grain-free. And the best part is that you're getting these products at 20 to 50% off of regular retail value. So that is going to be so much less than when you actually go to the store and buy them. In addition, you're getting 25% off your order, plus free shipping, plus a 30-day free trial. To take advantage of this incredible listener discount, all you need to do is go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. Go and check it out today. You are going to love it and you can thank us later. And now back to our chat with Sarah. And you share in the book that you went to see a doctor and this doctor actually recommended biofeedback. And I'd just love for you to share what this is. And I just think it's cool that this doctor recommended such a quote unquote alternative type of therapy. 
Yeah, you know, I didn't even really realize that it was alternative. I think living in New York City, you just have a lot more access to all kinds of different medical care. And so it didn't occur to me that this was something that other people might not be introduced to. But I have heard that from lots of people that they don't know what it is. And basically, you sit down and they attach little, I guess, electrodes to your arms. To me, it was to my arms. And the doctor just took me through a lot of scenarios, questions, mental exercises, getting me to focus on my breathing, asking me questions that would actually set my anxiety off and get my heart rate running and see what the things were that were triggering that response, and then show me how to what she calls downregulate, so that when you feel like you're totally up to the top of your head and beyond with just anxiety or whatever that bad feeling is that you might not have a name for yet, ways to do breathing exercises. There's a lot of different exercises, but one of them is to like focus on the tips of your toes and then focus on your ankles and then focus on your knees and then basically to slow you down and get you to really zero in on a good feeling. And then watch as the machine shows you what it's doing to your heart rate and and your panic response. In that way, you know, you get feedback and you're learning about what it is that sets you off and what it is that helps you downregulate. So it was very interesting. I did it for many, many, many weeks. I went to see her once a week, probably for six months or so before I felt like I didn't need to do that anymore. And one of the other tactics I want to get into involves a litter box and some sand that you got (laughs) at the craft store. So I just think this is really cool and a really neat story that our listeners would love to hear. So share how you brought this litter box, the sand into your office and what it did for you? So another exercise that my doctor asked me to do was to make a list of things that made me happy. It really could be anything. And for me, scented candles always make me happy, but you can't really burn a scented candle in your office. At least I wasn't allowed to burn scented candles in my office. And another thing for me is just sitting on the beach with my feet in the sand. And so I made this list of things and she said, try to incorporate them in your daily life as much as you can. And several of them, you know, like taking a bubble bath, you know, I also couldn't do that at the office and the office was where I was experiencing most of my anxiety. So I got a litter box and I got about 10 packages of craft sand from a craft store and I poured them into the litter box and I had smuggled the litter box into my office under my desk. And I would take off my shoes and just sink them in under the sand while I was sitting at my computer doing my email and stuff. It really was very relaxing. And I had a little tableau my assistant helped me out with. And I tell this story in the book, but she presented me with kind of a picture of a beach scene. It was very weird. I went to great lengths to accomplish it, but I have to say it worked wonders. Litter box full of sand. Who knew? And, you know, fast forward, you know, obviously you've figured out ways to manage your anxiety now. And I want to get to a point in a second, but it also goes to show that I'm sure there's still bouts that you have moments where you still have to deal with them and find ways to manage that in the moment. So I'd like for you to share some of the ways that you do manage anxiety now when it does come up. You have so many modalities that you've tested out. So what are some of the ways you use to manage your anxiety now? Well, the big one is that now I know what to look for. So a lot of the time, and I realized this was happening throughout my 20s, not just up until I had that panic attack when I was 31, but for many, many years before that, I was having all of these symptoms that I did not realize were anxiety related. So now I know when I'm trying to fall asleep at night and I have a crippling stomach ache, maybe it's not food poisoning, you know, maybe it's not whatever I ate, maybe that's a sign of anxiety. And so there are a lot of things that happen to me now that I can identify it before it goes too far. And I can say, oh, whatever I'm doing, whatever I'm thinking about, whatever is freaking me out right now, I need to stop. I need to take a breath. I need to take a walk. I need to close the laptop, whatever it is. So I think sort of an early warning system has been really valuable for me. And that's why I would recommend that people who are experiencing panic or anxiety either go to a doctor who can explain it to them or just read up on it. There's tons of literature out there. And you'll actually come to understand a lot of the symptoms in a way that you weren't recognizing them in time before. And also for me, I know that I really need to be well rested. I'm a huge proponent of rest in whatever form that takes. So I know that when I'm starting to feel anxiety coming on or panic coming on, it may mean that I need to go to bed at eight o'clock at night. You know, it may mean that I need to go directly upstairs to my bedroom and turn out the lights and just lay there for an hour in the middle of the day just to downregulate. So I would say that 
the ways that I handle it now are by being more proactive before it gets out of hand. And I also think it's important to note that I take a daily medication for this now. I take Zoloft, very small dose, but it has changed my life and that people should not be afraid to look for pharmaceutical intervention if more natural organic things are not working for them. There's a lot of stigma about taking medication for mental illness and I do not think there should be. So And I think expanding on that point, and thank you for bringing that up, is that so much of anxiety is people worrying about themselves or the future or just constant agonizing worrying. Something you shared in the book is that when you stopped worrying about this and started to embrace who you were and how you are, it changed everything. Exactly. And the whole premise of you do you is there is nothing wrong with you. And that is maybe a ironic premise for a self-help book that theoretically people are buying because there's something that they want to improve about themselves. But really, it's not you that's the problem. It's how you function within a society or a culture that maybe thinks there's something wrong with you when there isn't. And so it's learning how to embrace being yourself and how to stop caring about what other people think. And, you know, I wrote a whole chapter where the litter box anecdote comes in about being crazy and that word and being labeled crazy and about mental health awareness and things like that. And I think it's very important that we understand who we are. And instead of spending all this time trying to change who we are, just change the way we feel about who we are, which is actually easier to do. And a concept in the book that also you bring up is celebrating weirdness, which plays off this. And we need to let out our inner freak, so to speak, and yes. and have fun with that and do those silly things that we often guard ourselves and mask ourselves from being. How can we let our listeners in on the secrets of being more freaky and having more fun and doing the silly dance outside in front of other people and just being themselves? Well, I give a whole tutorial in the book on frolicking, which is one of my favorite pastimes. You know, I think that what people need to understand is that it's okay to give in to these impulses they might have to do something silly or to act a little bit weird. And that a lot of the anxiety and agonizing comes from the act of censoring yourself. It comes from the pressure that you create on yourself to not just be yourself. It certainly factored into the process by which I made new friends, for example, down here in Las Terrenas, because I didn't hold back to who I am. People saw me picking up a traffic cone on the street and putting it on my head to try to win a New Year's Eve hat contest. And I was okay with that. And the people who thought that was hilarious are the people who are my friends. So I think that it's important to be as kooky or weird as you feel like being. I don't think that you have to be weird in order to succeed as a person, but that chapter is really aimed at people who have felt like they've been censoring themselves for good behavior and just encouraging them to try letting their freak flag fly and see how that feels. And continuing on the topic of being you and putting yourself out there, you personally as a kid would spend a lot of time alone and you share in the book how You'd spend a few hours a week sitting on a stump and you'd be thinking, reading, daydreaming. Yeah, as long back as you can remember, you spend a lot of time alone and you enjoy this time. And I'd just love for you to share how this serves you. Yeah, so the book, You Do You, is constructed around what I call the social contract. And so there are different clauses of the social contract that we all feel compelled to follow. And one of those is be a team player. So that story comes from the chapter called Don't Be a Team Player, and it's sort of an ode to solitude and to independence. For whatever reason, I was a pretty solitary kid, and I liked it. And I don't think that people should be made to feel bad for wanting to be alone. Even within my marriage, and considering the fact that my husband and I are home together pretty much all day every day because we both work from home, there are times when both of us kind of look at the other one and say, I just want to be alone why don't you go off and do something? <laughs> so I really wanted to celebrate the desire not only to be alone, but also to be independent and to not necessarily want to work on a team. A lot of the examples that I gave from my childhood were situations where I was forced in a school context to work cooperatively with other kids. And I understand that's on the curriculum at a lot of schools, but it was bringing me down. 
I wanted to do things my way and I felt that that was the best way and I still feel that way as an adult. And when I'm wrong, I take responsibility. All I've ever wanted from a boss was to let me make decisions on my own and take responsibility and take credit if they turn out well. And so I never liked working on a team because I didn't like having to compromise my vision for something. And I didn't like having this question about whose fault something was. That's just not productive for me. So that whole chapter is really about celebrating people who don't necessarily want to be team players and to say that that is okay. That is an aspect of yourself that you don't have to change just because somebody else thinks that you should. And Sarah, you also describe yourself as a recovering perfectionist. This is a big topic I want to open up and get into perfectionism and just people who might be out there trying to create something in the world, but they're letting perfectionism get in the way and slow them down or stop them from ever creating their art. So as somebody that's been through this and now is at least somewhat on the other side, I'd love for you to share your story with perfectionism and how you've gone about toning that down. Yeah, I mean, that is a big one for me. That is really huge. And it was actually a former coworker of mine who labeled me a recovering perfectionist. And I thought that was really on point. And I would say that while a lot of the success that I have had in my life, just as a student and in my work, was as a result of being very focused and ambitious and having attention to detail. It also, that perfectionist tendency really set me up for much bigger falls when I failed at something. And that is what I would caution fellow perfectionists about. Not only can you wind up in a situation where you're paralyzed by your perfectionism, where you can't, as you said, put something out into the world because it's not perfect yet and it prevents you from creating anything at all, but also you can really feel the effects of failure so much more aggressively if you have convinced yourself that you're not allowed to be imperfect. And that was really, I think, what was the turning point for me, more that I didn't want to feel bad about being imperfect anymore. The bad feeling outweighed the good feeling of achieving perfection, if that makes sense. So I kind of hit this turning point where I said, God, I'm doing this to myself. Nobody else is expecting this of me. My husband always says that my standards for me are higher than anybody else's standards for me. And when I was able to internalize that and start working on it, I really unlocked a huge capacity for happiness in imperfection, which is something that I never had for three decades. So it's a really big part of who I am and the changes I've made in my life in the last three years. Are there certain tools or strategies you can recommend to the listeners if they feel themselves battling this perfectionism right now? A lot of the advice that I give in my books is based in humor. It's common sense, but it's also meant to be funny. So one of the things that I remind myself is that an Olympic gymnast or a diver or whoever is technically aiming for the perfect 10. Even somebody who's bowling league is aiming for that 300, that perfect score. And they almost never get it. And they still have amazing success. They still win gold medals, even though they weren't perfect. So when I apply that to my own life as somebody who I certainly have a lot of ambition, but I'm not out there trying to win a gold medal, I think I'm doing pretty good. You know, I don't have to be perfect. And I think about it a lot in terms of the baseball metaphor, because I'm a huge baseball fan, that you can get into the Hall of Fame if you're batting 300 lifetime. You know, and that means that you're failing 70% of the time. (laughs) So I try to think about it in relativity terms. Take it outside of myself is what I would tell people. Take it outside of yourself and look at how the rest of the world treats perfectionism and lack thereof and realize that you have been holding yourself to a far higher standard than anybody else. And I think a big message in all this is just being courageous and accepting yourself because whether you get to that perfect score or not, at least you try. And if you have a smile on your face and you're working towards something, that's where the confidence comes from. That's where the happiness comes from. And I know you talk about this in the book. And can you share any other ways to help our listeners let perfectionism go? Well, I think it's important to focus on each step of a whole. And this is something that I addressed in my previous book also, which was called Get Your Shit Together. But it's really about breaking things down into small, manageable chunks. And so I think whenever you are facing a task that you want to perform perfectly, and that could be 
being the perfect dinner party host, or it could be acing a test. Anything that you feel pressure to do perfectly, it's important to narrow it down to the individual components and to reward yourself for a job well done along the way. So maybe at the end of the night, your souffle didn't rise, but three people told you that you make the best deviled eggs they've ever had. Fine, your deviled eggs were perfect. You know, maybe the entire party wasn't perfect, but one part of it was. In all of my books, I talk about rewarding yourself. I think the quote in You Do You is, if you're always standing around waiting for someone else to pat you on the back, you're liable to be standing in the middle of the room looking like a dumbass. (laughs) It's important to congratulate yourself. And I think perfectionism can be beaten if you look at the parts of the whole instead of focusing on the whole, which is often, much like an Olympic gymnast routine, unattainable in terms of getting every single part of it perfect every time. And Sarah, I think a common problem for a lot of people these days is people pleasing. And there's too many people out there that are trying to please others. And you share a story where you hit a tipping point in your life when you're planning and executing your wedding. In this case, you weren't out there to please yourself. You're out there pleasing other people and you just weren't happy. So I'd love for you to share what went on there. And then we'll get into people pleasing a little bit more. Yeah. So this story I told in my first book, The Life-Changing Magic of Not Giving a, you know, and I might have touched on it again in You Do You, I don't remember actually. But basically, there were too many people who had too many opinions about how my husband and I were going to organize this event, which was theoretically for us to celebrate us and to reflect us. So I just started saying no. And one of the things I said no to was children in the bridal party. And one of the things I said no to was a sit down dinner with place cards. I said, people can seat themselves. Like, I'm not going to spend all this time and energy and agony trying to put people next to each other and then have them be upset that they didn't get seated next to somebody else. Pick your own seat. You're adults. And this went on and on. We chose not to have a brunch the day after, which was something that my in laws really wanted to do. And I said, well, you guys can host a brunch, but we won't be there. We'll be sleeping in because we'll have stayed up all night partying our our you know what's off and we don't want to get up early to have warmed over hotel buffet eggs with people you know now that the magic of the evening has passed i really put my foot down and that was a couple of years before the first panic attack so maybe i had had an inkling of where i was headed if i didn't stop giving so much of in the parlance of my first book a f word about what other people think so a lot of that book deals with people pleasing and really trying to retrain myself out of that people-pleasing mode. Now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with Sarah to give a shout out to our show sponsor, CoreChair. And we're back with the founder, Pat Harrison. And Pat, something that we really want to know about is what was the inspiration for the design of the chair? Really good question. I think probably the key thing to put in perspective is the fact that the traditional office chair as we know it has been around in its general concept for about 150 years There's been some refinements in technology and aesthetics, but functionally, it is a system that provides somebody almost too much support. Intuitively, over the last kind of 10 years or more, we've seen people who have been taking an exercise ball to the office because they know that they need to introduce movement into their day and they feel more comfortable doing it. So what CoreChair attempts to do is it's a bit of a disruptive innovation, and the idea is it provides optimal sitting posture and introduces movement into their day. Well, we love our core chairs. We're sitting on them right now as we record this ad. So thank you for the awesome design. And as a listener of our show, you get an incredible deal on your core chair purchase. To find out what that is, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash core chair. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash core chair. Also, you get a 60 day money back guarantee. So if you try the core chair and you don't like it for whatever reason, you can always return it. But we know you're going to love it. Go and get yourself a core chair today. And now a shout out to our other show partner, Sun Warrior. And today we got an awesome delivery, a restocking of Soul Good Bars. And these are Jesse's favorite bars. We've definitely talked about it before. Jesse loves to have these bars on hand because they're full of protein, easy to eat. They taste great. And we got the blueberry and the cinnamon twist. And literally within seconds, Jesse was eating a bar of cinnamon twist. And I think he's probably going to go for another one within moments. I love them. They're so delicious. They're so convenient. And they're essential to have on hand at all times. 
And as a listener of our show, you get 10% off Soul Good Bars and the whole lineup of Sun Warrior products. Super easy to take advantage. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. Again, that URL is ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. And for listeners in the US and Canada, you can bundle your order together, spend $100 or more, and you get free shipping. Go and load up with Soul Good Bars right now. And now back to our chat with Sarah. Jesse and I can so relate. We're in the midst of planning our wedding right now. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. And Thank also, you. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> well, you know what? We're actually not because we are doing this from the beginning in exactly the way that we wanted to, which is so nice. And it's refreshing to kind of hear you share that and that story. And we started off planning our wedding exactly the way we wanted. And luckily, there aren't a lot of people on board who are telling us what to do and not to do. But we're already doing everything unconventional. Well, quote unquote unconventional, having a brunch wedding, not doing place cards. You can wear heels if you want, but please don't. (laughs) All the things that are so us, because how would we want to show up to a wedding? So I fully get that. But the point I want to expand on here and, you know, elaborating on what Jesse said earlier in terms of people pleasing, what are people so afraid of? Like, And again, we're doing this in the context of the wedding. And don't get me wrong. There's times in my life where I know I'm holding back and not doing what I know I should be doing or really want to be doing. But let's strip away, like, why are people living in this, almost like we're characters in a movie, we're playing a part of someone that we're not. And I know it's a big question, but like, what is this fear at the baseline? Well, I think that human beings are very tribal. You know, we are conditioned from centuries ago to be part of a group and to not be cast off and left to fend for ourselves. And I think that that instinct informs a lot of the decisions we make, even in modern times, because you don't want to be the outcast. You don't want to lose that support system. I think that that is why people tend toward people-pleasing. Some people do it just a little bit, and some people are really crippled by it. But I think it's instinctive to not want to cut off your friends and family and support network by acting in a way that they might not approve of. And fortunately, in modern first world times, we are not in a situation where the person who may be providing water for your entire household can get pissy with you and decide not to bring you water. <laughs> like You can go get your own water. So all of my books are really focused on the self and self-reliance and the individual. And in that way, I think that I am advocating for releasing yourself a bit from the tribal mentality and realizing that you are your own best advocate. You are your own greatest support system. Certainly, it is wonderful to build relationships both at work and within your family and friend networks that can provide you know, additional support, but that it is more important, in my view, to get your own self sorted out before you worry about how everybody else is thinking about that self of yours. Does that make sense? It does. And then on the flip side, there's the person who maybe has already started practicing this and someone who is, quote unquote, being difficult or seen as difficult, but really they're just demanding what they want and taking a stand and asking for their food to be served a certain way at the restaurant or making sure that their standards or preferences are met. So those people at the same time are looked at as like, what are you doing? Why are you calling out what you want? That's so rude. Where's the happy medium? (laughs) You know, as you know, this is from the chapter in You Do You called Don't Be Difficult, which is another of those clauses of the social contract that I think have been pounded into our brains. And especially, I think, for women, we're conditioned to be accepting and to be accommodating and to be those people pleasers and not to say what we want and say no to what we don't want and push back and negotiate and all of these things that can actually create a better life for the individual. So I say, like I do with the advice in all of my books, you know, be honest, be polite, be direct, ask for what you want. There's no reason, for example, that if you book a hotel room and you show up and you find out that your hotel room is right next to the elevator and you know it's going to be really noisy, there's no reason you can't go downstairs to the front desk and say, hi, I wonder if you happen to have a room that's located further away from the, the elevator. It's that person's job to check the computer and tell you yes or no. And if they say no, they say no. But you're not being difficult by asking. You'd be difficult if you were mean about it, if you were nasty about it, if you blamed it on them. But if you just ask for what you want, I don't think that that's being difficult. Other people might accuse me of being difficult. And in that case, I would say, fine, I'm difficult. I'm selfish. I'm not a team player. 
but I'm doing all of these things in a way that really isn't hurting anybody else. So why is it such a problem for you? And when people start asking for what they want, do you find that it gets easier for them over time? Because that first time you're out there and going down to that hotel lobby and asking for that other room or saying that my steak isn't cooked to my liking or whatever it is, obviously, in the beginning, those things are really challenging. But how does it get over time? I say this to everybody when they say, oh, it's really hard not to give a you know what, or it's really hard to be me. Just try it. One of the biggest barriers to making any of these changes in your life is thinking that you can't. And when you try it and it works, you're like, oh, that was easy. This is great. I'm going to do this again. In that way, I guess I'm almost like a drug peddler or something. I'm like, just try it. You're going to love it. But really, the key is just not to be an asshole. Don't be rude to people. Don't be mean to people. Don't be dishonest. Just be really direct and ask for what you want and push back on what you don't. And you'll find yourself just getting a lot more of what you want and having your life be a lot more like you want it to be. And it really is very easy. I swear to God, it's easy. And something I want you to get back into from before is the concept that there's nothing wrong with you. You took two pages towards the front of the book and ham wrote this out in capital letters. Let's have you dig back into this. Well, I'm really conscious of working in the self-help space and sort of being known as a self-help guru of making sure that people understand that I view the entire self-help category and genre of books as being, in some senses and by some people, pretty exploitative. And that I want readers who come to my books to understand that I am not starting from a premise that there is something wrong with you that you have to fix. All of my books are about if you want your life to be different, if you want to be happier or more organized, here is how you can do it. But I don't want anybody to start reading You Do You from a place of thinking that there is something wrong with them that they have to change. It really is about changing how you feel about who you are. I have a concept that I call mental redecorating. Mental redecorating is taking a trait that people accuse you of possessing in a negative way and looking at it differently, looking at it in a positive way without actually changing the behavior that you're exhibiting. So, you know, I say when people say, oh, you're so selfish, I say, I'm actually really happy. That's what I think of as being selfish, is getting what I want and being happy. And if somebody says, you know, you're really picky, then you could say, actually, I'm just discerning. One of the examples I give in the book is that I may be really picky about where I want to have my birthday brunch, but because I'm so picky about it, because I'm really discerning, you guys are all going to have a really nice experience because I'm going to choose a great restaurant that is going to make everybody happy and whatnot. So mental redecorating doesn't ask you to change who you are. It asks you to think about who you are in a more positive way. And Sarah, I want to talk about the concept of quitting. And to get into this, I want to share a story that you share in the book, taking it all the way back to when you were 15 years old. And at this point, you had a summer job, you're working at a local surf and turf, and you quit this job. First of all, just share with us what you're doing at that place. I was working there because my boyfriend had a job there for the summer, and I was serving overpriced lobster to under-tipping summer travelers. (laughs) You ended up quitting, and this set off a loop in your brain that quitting is a bad thing. So I just want to get into quitting and talk about how we can quit in a positive way or if there is a positive way. And just to kind of wrap that whole story up, you ended up going back to the restaurant and I think they ended up calling your parents and telling they did. them that- They called my parents. They said, we can't lose her. The thing was, my boyfriend and I hated the job and he said, let's quit and we'll have the last week of our summer to ourselves. And I was like, okay. You know, and I had never quit anything before, but it was a terrible job. My boss was an awful person. You know, there were all sorts of reasons in the world for me to quit. I wasn't feeding my family on this salary. It wasn't an irresponsible decision. I was 15 years old and I just didn't want to show up there again. And so I mustered up all of my courage and I went into my boss's office and I quit and I felt terrible about it. I felt like I had done something wrong. And then my mom picked me up and I didn't tell her what I had done. And by the time I got up in the morning, my boss had called my parents and said, we need her to come back. And my parents, and I don't blame them for this, they said, you made a commitment to the summer job and we think you need to go back. I don't think that they did the wrong thing there, but it did set off this feeling that carried with me into the rest of my life that quitting was wrong. And that even if I wasn't 
happy or even if a job or a situation or relationship was actively upsetting me, it wasn't right to quit because I had made a commitment. And so that was really something that dogged me all of my life and especially throughout my professional working life from the time I moved to New York. And I really managed to bury that one when I quit that job that I mentioned at the very beginning of this podcast. (laughs) Well, that also brings up another concept of you taking a risk and you doing you and you starting a side hustle or at least thinking about something that you want to do that was away from the conventional. So let's empower our listeners about someone who might be on the fence right now or thinking about quitting or thinking about starting something on the side. How can they start taking those risks and feeling really good about them? Well, again, I would say that I'm not out here advocating that you jump without a net. Some people do that and it works out well for them and that's great. But what I talk about over the course of all three of the books that I've put out so far is how I managed to be this really type A perfectionist person who thought that it was wrong to welch on a commitment and was really unhappy and turned that into this brand new life. And I did it through small manageable steps. I did it through careful planning. I managed to every day for a year before I quit my job, I set aside a little bit of money from my checking account to my savings account. And I have all these charts in my second book and get your shit together about how much money you get if you do that daily, you know, with different amounts and how much you end up with at the end of the year. And that was a way for me to every single day know that I was putting something toward my goal and also know that when I left that job, I would have a cushion because I certainly wasn't working with much of a cushion at that time in my life. So it was important to me to feel that maybe I was taking a risk to go out on my own as a freelance editor and writer, but I was pretty confident in my abilities, but I didn't want the additional risk of doing it with zero dollars in the bank. So I would say make calculated risks and do your planning and take a step toward your goal, a little step every day or a little step every week, which helps you feel accomplished, like I talked about in terms of perfectionism, rewarding yourself and congratulating yourself on a small step forward is a really good way to want to take another small step forward tomorrow. I'm a big fan of stepping outside your comfort zone and doing something with your life that you've always wanted to do or just shaking things up because you're unhappy and want to be happier. But I also am a really big fan of planning it out and really thinking hard about what the future holds and how to get there and then doing a little bit at a time so that it's not so overwhelming. In the end, that year that I spent saving is like a blink of an eye right now when I'm sitting here looking outside at the palm trees, at my pool, with my laptop where I'm writing my fourth book. It certainly seems like those little sacrifices that I made in 2014 were worth it. That's amazing. And something else I want to get into before we wrap up is just talking about family. And so many of us put our family first and a lot of people, it's a very healthy, happy situation. And and that is the case. But let's talk about why family doesn't necessarily always have to come first and how we should really choose carefully who the people are in our lives and why we want to spend time with them. Yeah. So this is something that comes up a lot in interviews because people are always a little bit aghast at my viewpoint. But that clause in the social contract that says, always put your family first, I don't agree with because I agree with the fact that if your family loves and respects you, then great, you can love and respect them right back. But if you have a family situation, as so many people do, where somebody is not showing you love and respect, I don't think that you need to grant them any more of your time and energy than you feel is right and necessary. And that might be zero of your time and energy. I think that it is a gift that we get to choose our friends. And I think that some of my best friends in the world I would rather spend time with than some of my worst family members. And if my parents are listening, I'm not talking about them. (laughs) But, you know, I think that there's a lot of sort of fetishization, and maybe this comes from that inherent tribalism, of the family unit and of putting family above other things when you don't necessarily really want to. And you might find out that they didn't want to be put above other things either, that you guys would all be happier if you weren't at that barbecue together. And I think, again, it's really important to just be honest and direct with people. This has been an ongoing thing for myself and my husband with our families to get them to understand our point of view that the world doesn't necessarily revolve around them, even though they're lovely people. 
that we don't all want to do the same things and spend our time, energy, and money in the same way and that that's okay. And I think this doubles in many situations in our life. And in your TEDx talk, I really like that you talked about visualizing certain events or things that are about to take place and putting ourselves into that moment, whether it is a family event, Christmas or birthday parties or whatever it is, or a coworker's going away party or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. putting yourself into that mindset. And if it already stresses you out and you're not even there yet, that is probably a really good gauge to use in your life. Yeah, that's a really good takeaway for your listeners is just to do a quick visualization exercise. Whenever you get asked to do something or invited to go somewhere and think before you say yes, which is the default response that so many people and people pleasers want to do right away, just think before I say yes to my cousin's wedding in Pittsburgh in March of next year, imagine what you're going to feel like when you're in Pittsburgh in March, (laughs) you know, imagine what you're going to feel like when you're standing in line at the airport at four o'clock in the morning and you're like, why did I say yes to this? I don't want to do this. Now, obviously you might want to do that. Maybe you love your cousin so much that it's worth it to you to do that. And it doesn't mean that you don't love them if you don't want to go. Your time, your energy, and your money, those are things that you are allowed to spend as you see fit. So we opened up the interview talking about your move to Dominican Republic, and you just touched on the palm trees, the swimming pool out back. And I'm just curious now, after you've been there for a couple of years, does this move feel like a permanent move for you? I don't know. You know, a lot of people ask us that. And I think that we have just realized that nothing is really permanent in our lives. You know, we thought when we bought our first apartment in New York City, we were like, well, we're going to die in this apartment. We really thought that was the end. And obviously a lot changed over the course of that decade. So we love it here. We have no intention to go anywhere. But I wouldn't be surprised if one day we started talking about, hmm, there's something else we might want to do for a few years. So we'll see. Yes, that makes sense. And Sarah, in wrapping up, you know, thank you so much for this. This has been great. And we would love our listeners to get a copy of You Do You. Other than them getting a copy of that and your other books, how else can our listeners connect with you? Well, they can find me on Twitter and Instagram, both of which I'm really active. And my handle is MC Snugs. That's M C S N U G Z. And they can go to SarahKnightAuthor.com and find all of the information on my books all of the other articles I've written and that sort of stuff. And then later this year, there's going to be a whole new revolutionized nofgivenguides.com, which is the umbrella of all of my books. And I'll have a new book out in January. So we're building that site right now, but they can check back later in the year. And that's just going to be a hub for everything. All right. I got to ask, what does the MC Snug stand for? It is a reference to my dear departed cat, Doug who had many nicknames, one of which was MC Snugs. Gotcha. Gotcha. And I also have to ask, your first book, The Life-Changing Magic of Not Giving a F... I know that was a playoff of Marie Kondo's book. I'm just curious about how, you know, that all panned out in terms of the title and... How she responded. How she responded, yeah. No, I don't think she really has me on her radar. (laughs) But basically, the book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, that you mentioned by Marie Kondo was big a couple of years ago. I mean, it's still big, but it was big a couple of years ago, and it really sparked this kind of decluttering movement. And I read her book right after I left my job in the summer of 2015, and I liked it, and I took a bunch of tips away that I still use to this day. But I, as I was reading it, I just sort of thought, you know, what she's doing for your physical space, I really think people need to do for their mental space. And I had all of these ideas about how I could parody her book for mental decluttering instead of physical decluttering. And so, you know, I had the idea, I wrote a proposal, I got an agent, I sold the book, and it all happened really quickly. And by the time I was done writing it, I was like, you know, this is actually a really good self-help book in and of itself, not just as a parody. It took off and, and it spawned now the next three books in my series, which have nothing to do with Marie Kondo, but are really just sequels to my own best-selling book about mental decluttering. So I am forever grateful to Marie Kondo for being the source of that inspiration one random summer day in 2015. And I highly recommend her book. And I think that people can get a lot out of it. But I think mental decluttering for me was more useful than physical decluttering. And they're so great. I love the way you write. It's so funny. It's they're so easy to read and they're just so practical. So kudos to you. (laughs) Thank you. One more thing I want to touch on too before we leave. So you got your hands on her book in 2015. 
Yeah, I was going to send it to my mom (laughs) because I think my mom needs it. And then it was sitting on my shelf and I felt like it was really passive aggressive to send it to my mom. So I read it myself instead. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. I've heard you tell that story before, but that's good. Yeah. (laughs) The point I want to make behind all this too is we're in 2018 now. Everything's happened relatively quickly for you. You're already on to writing your fourth book and things are just on fire. Good for you. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I need to stop and bury my feet in the sand, the actual sand, not the litter box, you know, take a nap in a dark room, but it's all been chaotic for the good instead of chaotic for the bad. So I'm really grateful for that. Well, I got to say, I'm happy for you. It came full circle with the sand. It started in your office. (laughs) Now you are in Dominican where sand is plentiful. So congrats to you. We're going to link everything up over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com. And Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the show. We got into lots of fun stuff. The listeners are going to love this. Yeah, thank you guys for being such careful, attentive readers. I'm so impressed. (laughs) Thank you, Sarah. We enjoyed it. Take care. We hope you guys enjoyed today's conversation with Sarah and you are ready to do you. Such a great message and so much great information. And we hope that you are listening to the show on our new app that you can get over at ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash Apple app. And if you are, take a picture on your phone right now, tag MC Snugs and Ultimate Health Podcast. Let us know what you're thinking. Share it on Instagram on your stories and keep spreading the ultimate health love. And another little announcement for you guys is Jesse and I are going to be taking a break from our Focus Fridays for the summer. So I am sorry to say that you will not be getting a release of a Friday episode every other Friday until the fall. So just lots of great guest interviews coming out. So stay tuned for what's coming out next week. Before we let you guys go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jason Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jace, thanks for doing such a great job putting the show together. And this week's fun fact about Jace is that he's looking forward to another month of traveling at the end of this month. And some of the places he'll be traveling to include San Sebastian, Rome, Prague, and High Tatras. Awesome, man. I hope you have a blast. Listeners, have a great week. We'll talk to you soon. Take care.